Okay. All right, just um, again, a heads up for, for uh, those of you here, and please pass this on to everybody else uh, in, case my, <laughs> in case it doesn't get through again. Next week, there will not be a class <coughs> because um, I'm going to a wedding. Um, so a friend of mine's uh, daughter is getting married. So, okay. Alrighty, let's begin. Um, we are now going to be starting uh, Tikkun number five. Now, just a little bit of background. Um, the Tikkun Zohar is one of the fundamental sections of the Zohar. Tikkun means rectifications, but it also means garments. Um, because what the Zohar is trying to do here is to put um, uh, you know, like to use an idiom, to put the sheet over a ghost, uh, to put a sheet over the ghost so that you can see the ghost kind of thing. In other words, trying to put on sort of clothing onto, um, onto very abstract ideas in order to clothing. When I say clothing, I don't mean that literally. It means conceptual in a conceptual sense. In order that the uh, idea will become a little bit more um, revealed. Now, this particular tikkun, is a very fundamental one. It's got some very uh, important teachings in it, but it also happens to be one of the most uh, difficult ones in terms of its being very abstruse, very difficult to, um, yeah, there's a whole system being given over and um, it's talking about extremely, extremely high levels of, um, of, divine revelation essentially and therefore it makes it very difficult to um, to bring it down to a level where we can really grasp it but I'll try my best to do at least you know bring out at least one main point or a couple of main points so let's just um, uh, look at the text uh, for a minute um, if you can see the text on the screen I'm sure you can you see that letter there that letter there is the letter bet. Um, let's see if we can make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, there we go. Okay, that letter there is called the letter bet. Now, the letter bet over here, the word breshit, the Tikkun Zohar, as I've mentioned many times before, uh, is a discussion of the first word of the Bible, the first word of the Torah, the word Bereshit. And over here, it breaks the word Bereshit into two, um, into two words, really, the letter, the one letter, and then the word Bereshit. Bereshit means beginning. The word Bereshit itself means in the beginning, but the Zohar finds a number of different explanations of what this idea of the beginning is. So we see that there's a bet, and um, in truth, the way it's written over here, it's written without the dot in it, which is really the way it's written in the Torah, in scripture, in the Bible. It's actually written with a dot in the bet. Now, there's a, what's, what's the purpose of the dot? It's really a grammatical thing. Uh, if you read it without a dot, you would read it as vereshit, you read with a V. Whereas if you, if, when it has a dot in it, you read it as a B. Right, Bereshit, um, in the beginning. So, the way it's written is with a, with, with a bet. So, the Zohar calls this Nakuda Bahechole. It's the Nakuda, it's the central point in the chamber or the central point in the palace. The central point of what? He goes on to explain what the central point is. Vahai Nakuda, this Nakuda, this central point, this is the hidden thought. The hidden thought. Uh, yes, yeah, in a high dimension, that's correct. Yes. Um, it's a hidden thought. Now, we have to understand what this hidden thought is. This is where things get very, very complex. Um, I'm not going to explain it in uh, great depth, but suffice it to say, that as we know, uh, I didn't call up a chart of the Svirot, which I should have done. One second. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, this is good enough. Look at that one. All right. Um, the Zohar goes on to, to explain as follows. <clears throat> The, the Nakuda, the dot in the palace, is Chochma, this sphere over here, Chochma, in, within Bina. Bina is represented by the Bet. They have the same uh, beginning letter, the Bet. Chochma is the point within the Bet. Right? That, point, that little dot within the Bet. So, what the Zohar uh, goes on to explain is as follows. That dot, that dot within the within the uh, the letter bet, um, is a point of light within a structure called the palace. Now, what does that mean? First of all, what is the origin of that point of light? Well, the origin of that point of light is really from Keter, right? From Keter, there's various levels in Keter. And one of the levels in Keter um, illuminates Chokhmah. And then from Chokhmah, it goes to Bina. Chokhmah illuminates Bina. Now, what does this mean in practical terms? Let's just understand uh, the idea. If you are um, trying to find let's say you're um, going to give a lecture or something, you're going to um, explain a concept to somebody. So in order to explain the central concept to them, so you have to give them sort of the context. Before you explain the concept, you have to give them the context. The context uh, of the idea and kind of the ramifications thereof. When you're thinking about it for yourself, in order to be able to come to the central concept of what any particular idea is about, let's say you were just talking about, for example, I don't know, anything, take, uh, take any concept that people speak a lot about, let's say something like the theory of relativity. Now, I'm not a scientist, um, um, but just think about a concept. What is the central concept of the theory of relativity? So in order to be able to get to that, it took Einstein quite a, quite a while to be able to understand or to get to the central idea of what he was seeing as um, uh, sort of a, a relative world, uh, which had to do with uh, space and time, which prior to Einstein were regarded as something fixed and something constant. And Einstein explained that space and time were just as malleable as anything else. They're just as changeable as anything else. So he had to get to the center of this idea and what it was all about. And similarly, when we try to explain any concept to, to anybody, we have to try to get to the very core of what it's all about. And then we can explain the ramification, we explain it clearly, we, we can explain, uh, we can answer questions about it because we know what the central core, the central idea is. But when you're at the edges and you haven't gotten to the central idea yet, you don't really understand what the whole thing is all about. So the movement, in order to be able to understand it, or what is called, um, in, uh, in Hebrew, it's called Hibbonanut, the meditation on this concept, in order to get to the core idea that this concept delivers, so you start from the outside in. You start from the, from, from the structure, to the central idea of what this is all about. And then when you grasp the central idea, then you can um, be said to understand clearly. Now, a good teacher, <coughs> when he's teaching something, won't teach it from the outside in, he'll teach it from the inside out. He'll teach it from the core idea, and then he'll dress that core idea in various um, analogies, in various um, ramifications of that idea, 
in various connections that idea has to other ideas and so on and so forth. But he'll teach it from the inside out. So this is what the um, this is what the Zohar is talking about. It's really talking about the idea of from the inside out. It starts off in Keter, which is something that essentially transcends intellect. It's called, um, uh, Keter is called Ayin, nothingness. So the central idea comes out of nothingness and it's first glimmering as a point of light is in Chochmah, in other words, a point of revelation. So it comes from nothingness into revelation, and that revelation is in Chochmah. But in Chochmah, it's only a point. In order for that point to be manifested fully, as we know, a point in uh, mathematics has no dimensions. Right? It doesn't exist uh, in a, in a, a point has no dimensions. When does it get dimensions? When it's in Bina. The point gets, di gets dimensions when it's manifested in Bina. Bina is the structural component of an idea. That which fleshes that idea into, into a complete structure. One of the analogies that's used for this uh, in Kabbalah is actually the analogy of a husband and a wife. Chokhmah is the husband, Bina is the wife. And just as in order for the child, that baby to grow in the womb and then eventually outside of the womb, so then you need that, that, that seminal drop, that first drop, which then fer it becomes fertilized and starts to grow and starts to expand and starts to become a being, starts to become a reality within Bina. So Chokhmah and Bina are always working together. In fact, the Zohar says about Chokhmah and Bina that these are called the two lovers who never part. Because Chokhmah without Bina doesn't operate and Bina without Chokhmah doesn't operate. You have to have both. Does that mean that Bina doesn't ha uh, only, uh, only gets its character through Chokhmah? No. As you can see over here, the path, there's a path from Keter to Bina just as there's a path from, Chokh, uh, from Keter to Chochmah. It's a different path. The uh, path to, to Bina comes from a different level of Keter than the path to Chochmah. But nevertheless, the two of them operate together, ignore dark for, for, for right now, the two of them operate together like a husband and a wife, and they, they work in concert in order to give birth, so to speak, to the rest of the Svirot. The rest of the Svirot being uh, what's called Ben, the, ma the male Svirot, the, the male child, so to speak, and then Malchut, which is the female child. Right, Malchut, the female, the, the, the girl. And then Malchut itself, of a higher world, becomes Keter of the next world. The advantage of Malchut, the, 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 uh, which is called, in fact, Malchut is called Chokhmah Tata, the lower Chokhmah. Why? Because just as Chokhmah emerges from nothingness and is, a, is merely a point, so Malchut too returns to a state of nothingness. It's a little bit of a different state. Um, the, the nothingness of Malchut is called Shiflut, humility. Whereas the nothingness of Chokhmah is um, um, let me change that. The, the nothingness of Chokhmah is humility and the nothingness of Malchut is humbleness. Now, is there a difference between humbleness and humility in English? Um, humbleness is more circumstantial. Humility is more, um, it's more of an inward thing. It's more of an inward cultivation. In any event, it doesn't really matter. This is called, this is called Chokhmah Tata, the lower Chokhmah, because it returns to a state of lack of ego. It returns to a state of lack of ego. That's Malchut. 
So the idea of um, of um, the the point of light within the palace is when Chochma inseminates Bina and Bina starts to grow the child within, so to speak, that, that, that baby that, that develops and grows and eventually emerges into the world. Okay, so that's all as far as the procedure from God to the world is concerned. It's a, a, it's a top-down approach. However, as far as we're concerned, instead of um, the top-down approach that we're usually uh, used to, we have to start off with a structure that we can see with the visible world, with what's visible, with the structure. We start with the structure and hopefully we can get to the core. It's very much like uh, the structure of the temple in um, the biblical temple. Um, there was the outer form thereof, and then the more, the deeper you went into it, the closer you got to the ark, and upon the ark rested the divine presence, the shechina, the divine presence. So you went from the outside in. And that's unfortunately uh, most of the time how we have to operate. We have to operate from the outside in. But when it comes to organizing um, one's life, one can also do it from the inside out. In other words, what is it that I want, uh, in, in, in very simple uh, language, what is it that I want to achieve? What is my goal? Where am I... Um, uh, what are my priorities? What do I have to, what is it that I want to achieve? And then one builds around that a structure, in other words, a system to achieve those goals. The, the, the goal would be Chokhba. The system would be in Bina. So now, the advantage of doing things this way is, um, in other words, clarifying what the ultimate goal ought to be of a person's life. Clarifying that is um, very useful because then the structure can be built around the point. The palace can be built around the point of light. Because very often what happens is um, when a person begins from from building the structure without knowing where they're going it turns out that the structure is the wrong structure in order to achieve that particular goal or uh, the structure is completely out of sync with the centerpiece of what the of, of what the person's goal should really be to put it in uh, other terminology um, To seek out one's purpose in life first before um, building the system by which to implement that in order to, um, to, to manifest that uh, purpose in life, that is um, something that um, would best be done from the inside out rather than from the outside in. Now, these are two forms of, uh, really two forms of meditations I mentioned earlier. One form of meditation is um, to start from the outside, from the outside, so the outer circle, so to speak, or the outer, the outer structure, the outer, the outer walls, and move in, try and move into the center. That can be very, very difficult because, uh, as you probably know, when you start from the outside of a uh, structure to find where exactly the center is, you don't know really where you started because the, the starting point, wherever it is that you start, is um, you can't see where it is in relationship to the rest of the building. Now, if it's completely symmetrical, then it doesn't really matter where you start. If it's not completely symmetrical, then of course it matters where you start. 
Uh, and it might take a person very much longer if they start from the bottom of the rectangle and the um, and the dot or the goal is in the top third or something like that. If you start from the bottom of it, then it's going to be much more difficult to achieve. So, uh, therefore, it is a very good idea and perhaps more than a good idea. It is um, probably the... Um, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, it is probably the prime way to actually achieve what it is you want to achieve by starting off with the uh, by starting off with the main goal and then trying to find ways to manifest it now um, although I'm not a business person um, I have heard that many uh, very very successful entrepreneurs didn't uh, start off sort of um, how shall I say it, you know, in the, in the packing room where they would uh, pack cardboard boxes or whatever and then work his way up to be the CEO. No, he started with an idea. And then he found some way or another, he or she found in one way or another to, uh, to, to, to bring this goal out into, re into a reality in the world around them. So this is the idea that the Zohar starts to speak about. Now, interestingly enough, um, as Rabbi Shimon starts to explain this idea of the dot in the palace, and he explains it from a number of different points of view, so um, Elijah, Elijah the prophet, uh, suddenly appears. Now, when I say suddenly appears, um, this was a common occurrence uh, with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that uh, Elijah, Elijah the the prophet, Elijah the prophet, had, had uh, passed away from this world many, many uh, generations before, many generations before. But nevertheless, um, well, let me just explain what happened to to Elijah and why he appeared to Rabbi Shimon. It's it's where the the Zohar tells us, the various other holy works tell us that. Elijah is one of the spiritual teachers. So although he was a prophet, he, did, he never actually died physically. He just ascended to a higher plane of existence. So although he's no longer in this world, uh, he became uh, an angelic being. And he is the, uh, one of the masters of the keys. Is one of the people that comes to teach the secrets of Kabbalah to uh, his, to the various uh, seekers of the truth, the seekers of uh, mystical wisdom. There is another teacher as well who um, is probably even more uh, important in our times, and that is the teacher of Elijah. The teacher of Elijah was someone named Achia Hashiloni. Achia Hashiloni. So this Achia was the teacher of the Baal Shem Tov. Um, Elijah was the teacher of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, and he was the teacher of the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria as well, spiritual teacher. But Achia Hashiloni, the teacher of, he, of, of the teacher, the teacher of Elijah, of Eliyahu, of Elijah, was the one who taught the Baal Shem Tov. Now, the uh, Zohar says over here that um, Elijah came along and he said, he, he suddenly appeared and he said to Rabbi Shimon, you, call it, you are calling this the point, the dot, or the point, the point of light in the palace. However, the letter bet, if you look on the screen over here, is open on one side. You say that it is a closed system around this point. But it's not closed, it's open on one side. So you have to explain that. Now, Elijah knew the answer to it. <laughs> it wasn't that he didn't know the answer, he knew. But he was um, providing an opportunity for Rabbi Shimon to actually explain this concept which he had not explained and which he now goes on to explain. He basically says like this. 
that it's true that one side is open. But that side that's open is open for a reason. The reason is that every person who achieves the level of Chochmah will close it up in his particular way. It's not, there is a structure around it that's fixed. But the fourth wall is not fixed. And that's a very important concept. Wouldn't that be called being in alignment? Oh, sorry, I didn't see this before. Uh, Shelly, I'm not sure what you were for referring to. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Um, so the fourth wall is provided by each individual. In other words, a certain structure, you have to remain within certain parameters. The the bet has a fixed structure, but the fourth wall of the bet is open. And that fourth wall, oh, we're talking about having a goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. Okay. So we'll be in alignment, yes. Called being in alignment, okay, correct. So the fourth wall, therefore, is one that you have to provide. In other words, that's your contribution from the inside out. It's your mo mode of expression of thing. Now, when we say a wall, it doesn't mean a wall blocking you out. It means a structure that you built in order to share with others, right? It's not a, um, it's not a structure uh, that keeps others out. It's a, structures, a structure that, that is by which we share with other people. Um, there were many um, great Kabbalists who, when the students came to ask questions, uh, let's, uh, let, let me correct that. Not many, there were a few. There were a few great Kabbalists who, when the students came to ask questions, very often they didn't answer in speech. They didn't answer, they didn't give an actual verbal answer. They, why? Because to give a verbal answer sometimes to a question, to give a verbal answer, takes much, much longer than other forms of communication. I'll explain in a minute. Um, but just like um, um, there's a story that is told about the chief disciple of Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the Rabbi Rizal. His chief disciple was someone named Rabbi Chaim Vital. So Rabbi Chaim Vital once went uh, on a on the Sabbath afternoon he, in the summer. He went to visit his teacher, and his teacher was taking a nap. And he saw that his eyelids were moving, and he was obviously having a dream. So when the teacher woke up, student Rabbi Chaim asked uh, Rabbi Yitzhak the Arizal. He asked him, um, "What were you dreaming about?" So I said, in order to explain that to you, I would need 80 years. Right? 80, I would need 80 years in order to explain to you what I was dreaming about. Why? One of the explanations that's given is because what you see in one glance takes many, 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 many words to explain. And same thing with uh, the Rizal, what he saw in one, in a few minutes of dreaming would take him years and years to explain. And um, so the idea that we were uh, that, that that we're talking about is that um, Eliyahu, Elijah came along to Rabbi Shimon and he said to him, um, "The side of the bed is open," mm -hmm. and Rabbi Shimon said, "Each one will fill that wall in as he sees fit, according to who he is." So therefore, when certain Kabbalists, the people would go and ask the questions, they wouldn't answer verbally. It would take them too long to answer verbally. And a verbal answer means that you've got to start from the words that your teacher says and work your way back to the idea. What would they do? They would somehow manage to transfer the idea to the person that they wanted to transfer it to in silence. So um, this is called in in, uh, in 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 
the, the, the language of the sages, it's called Shtika Siyag Lachokma. Silence is the fence around wisdom. Silence is the fence around wisdom. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means two things. On one hand, uh, you know, they make a joke, uh, which happens to be very true, but um, they make a joke that um, it is better to remain silent and be thought of as a fool than to open your mouth and prove it. <laughs> that's, one, <laughs> that's one explanation. But the, more, the deeper explanation is <coughs> that communicating something not on a verbal level demands from the teacher and the student a deeper level of communication. Now for the teacher, that's not so much the problem. The problem is for the student. So one of the things that some of these Kabbalists, they forced their students, forced them, I mean, uh, you know, obviously they were willing to be their students, but they forced the students to get to a deeper level in order to be able to sense what the answer was from their teacher. It's a famous story that illustrates this. It's a story of Rabbi Shnei Zaman of Liadi, the founder of the Chabad Hasidim, Chabad uh, or Lubavitch branch of, uh, of Hasidim, Hasidism. And the story is told that, um, uh, without going to all the details, I've told the story here before, it's, uh, it's, it's an important story. But he was invited to, to, to speak um, to a room full of uh, very great scholars. And the way things were done in those days was he would give a sort of a, uh, a, a lecture, a shortish lecture, it could be a long lecture also. And then he would answer people's questions, not necessarily questions on the subject, but questions about any subject. Uh, any subject that um, the questioners care to address. So um, the, the room was packed with very great uh, scholars and sages, and he wasn't able to, he would not have been able to answer them all. So he said that instead of giving a lecture, he would just like to sing them a song. And um, the song was a very, um, very sort of a mystical, a very mystical song and made everyone like sink deeply into their own minds, into their own thoughts, so that each of them, and many of them testified afterwards that this is the way it was, um, a person's question was answered from within. In other words, he didn't answer their questions, but they went to a deeper place in themselves where they could find the answer or whether he communicated uh, the answer to them via his song. But he took them to a deeper place where the question was no longer a question, where the question was answered. And as a result, many of these uh, sages in that room actually became his followers and disciples. But that's the idea of... Um, of communicating in silence. There was a famous uh, Hasidic rabbi, Rebbe, called Rabbi Yitzhak of Vorke, Rabbi Isaac of Vorke, that that's the way he would communicate. He wouldn't, he wouldn't talk. Um, he would try and communicate on a much deeper level, soul-to-soul -soul communication rather than uh, word, you know, uh, voice to ear communication rather than by way of hearing which is a lower form of communication and communicate kind of directly okay so that's what the Zohar over here is uh, essentially talking about it's talking about how um, the communication the way the uh, the, the uh, dot or the point of light in the palace becomes communicated in the fourth wall on the fourth um, side of things, that is left up to the teacher to uh, to choose. Okay, I think we're going to stop now. Unless you have some questions, I'll be happy to address any questions. Again, uh, for those of you who just came in a little bit late, there will not be a class next week, and I don't know why, but uh, my emails are not getting through to everybody. I'm going to try with a different Gmail email. 
it'll be coming from Kabbalah decoded rather than from uh, ravm.icja and we'll see what happens then. Uh, in fact, I will probably send out an email from there earlier in the week just to make sure that it's getting through and then you can just email me back and tell me you got it or you didn't get it or whatever. Obviously, if you didn't get it, you won't know that I sent it, but um, let's do it that way. All right. Okay, folks, is there any, uh, any questions? Uh, you mentioned that you, I keep seeing it as a vessel. Can you speak on this? Sure. Um, yes, the ego is a vessel, but it can be two kinds of th there, 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 uh, there, there's a, an advantage and a disadvantage of a vessel. One advantage of a vessel is that you can sort of package stuff in it and you can bring it over to where it has to go. The other, the, the disadvantage of it is that it tends to conceal what's within it. So if the ego is a vessel, then what is it a vessel for? If it's a, if it's a vessel for the godliness that's inherent within a person, then there's nothing wrong with that. Then it's, then, then it's fine. On the contrary, that's exactly what we want. That vessel expresses godliness. However, if the vessel is one that conceals the godliness within it, then that's not a good situation. Then the vessel, so to speak, has to be polished. It has to be um, like, you know, a diamond or a, any precious stone, really, but a diamond is the best example. A diamond, when you actually hew it out of the ground, it just looks like a stone, more or less like any other stone um, on the outside. It has to actually be cut and polished and, uh, and treated in a certain way in order to bring out all the facets and the beauty of the, of the, of the diamond inside. But um, on the outside, you could easily mistake it for just a regular stone. Um, and the ego is the same thing. The ego on the outside just looks like, a, you know, a, a, it's a regular stone. It's just not, there's nothing there. Uh, it's just the stone. But when one learns to polish it so that the light shines out from within, then uh, that stone is a very useful stone. The ego is a very useful thing. You see, ego is not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily an, e an evil thing. The way we speak about ego, generally we understand that the ego is self-seeking, in which case, yes, that's not a good thing. That's, a, that's, that's the origin of evil, essentially, self-seeking. But the ego doesn't have to be that. It just has to be who I am, the I. Um, without getting into all the Freudian terminology for, <laughs> for the different levels of I. But if the, uh, the ego just simply means that's who I am in the physical world, and this is the way I express what's uh, inherent within me, this godly soul that's inherent within me, then, uh, you know, that's... That's not a negative ego necessarily. I hope that answers the question. Refining the vessel of the ego, yes. Now, there, there are those that, um, that um, talk about the ego as um, essentially the animal soul. But um, the animal soul has its uses. There's, a, there's the godly soul, the animal soul together. If you want to have understand more about this concept, there's a work called Tanya, T-A-N-Y-A, -A, the Tanya. You have a look, that's uh, the subject of the first few chapters where he discusses this whole idea of the godly soul and the animal soul, and the two of them kind of work together, or unfortunately, in many cases, against each other. Uh, the animal soul is self-seeking, it's like an animal, it doesn't have consciousness, it doesn't have God consciousness, uh, and the godly soul has, uh, does have God consciousness and they, they're constantly in conflict, which is why some, sometimes uh, people this inner conflict that they have leads to a state of, um, of uh, temporary, hopefully, insanity of one sort or another. It's like schizophrenia and things like that. Now, I don't say schizophrenics are having a battle between uh, the godly soul and the animal soul. It could, could be that it's not that at all. Um, most probably it's not that, that at all, but there is the same idea of this battle that's going on us on in within us all the time. The few, first, I think, 12 chapters of Tanya speaks about this uh, in depth. 
And it's a struggle, it's a battle. But if one sees the vessel as a means to an end rather than uh, a barrier, it's a means to an end, then uh, one can put it to use, you can put it to work, just as we can put, um, you know, an animal to work pulling a plow uh, or a cart, as they used to do in those days. Uh, most of the volumes of the Zohar in English now, but I haven't started reading it yet. Where is the Tikkun Zohar found so I can find it, read it, and try to make sense of it? Now, the Tikkun Zohar is a separate uh, set of volumes of the Zohar, and it's not printed together with the regular Zohar. Oh, excuse me, I don't know if there is in the Sonsino. Yeah, give the ego a purpose, right. I don't know if the Sonsino version, which is the one you probably have, has the Tikkun Zohar. I don't think it does, actually. And the translation of it is terrible. Or oh, which one do you have, the Daniel Matt or the Sonsino? You know, Shane? Matt version. Yeah, the Matt version. The Matt version is uh, it's far more accurate than, than the Sonsino version. I don't like the Matt version because it tends to not explain... Um, terminology, like for instance, when we talk about Atik Yomin, like he'll just translate it as the ancient of days, and instead of explaining like what it is, you know, it's a level in Keter and what it represents and what it, what it achieves and so on. But it's generally an accurate translation, so you can uh, you can use that. And I keep thinking that is all the riders and the horses and donkeys and beasts, different stages of the ego under our control instead of controlling us. Yes, exactly. Right. That is correct. Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll call it a day. And again, what I think of Daniel Matt, the truth is I never met him personally. Um, I had a look at his Zohar here and there in, in places. Uh, I wasn't super impressed, but um, it's a translation. Uh, and as a translation, it's, it's, you know, it's a reasonably accurate translation, but I do feel that he kind of left the soul of the Zohar out of his translation. <laughs> now, to put a soul into a translation is not easy. I have a translation of only the first few sections of, um, of the Zohar, the first few parshas, and it's actually selections, it's not the whole thing. Why haven't you found it? Uh, you can get it from me if you want. Um, okay. All right, send me an email and we'll set something up. All right, folks, uh, I think we'll call it a day there. And again, no class next week. All right, good night.